Alrighty. Um, thank you very much for uh, showing up to this session. Uh, as Phil said, my name is Neela Jacques. I'm the executive director of the Open Daylight Project. Um, what I want to go through today is just a, an overview of where we are as a project. Um, touching a little bit about where we are, both in terms of our maturity, our technology, but most importantly, I want to spend a little time talking about how I'm seeing end users actually engaging with Open Daylight. Um, for those of you who might have seen um, uh, this presentation, these slides are very similar to what I gave at the Open Daylight Summit, so if any of you have, you have seen that, you're going to find uh, a lot of the slides similar. I wanted to start um, talking a little bit about the end user perspective. Um, we're going to start there, we're going to end there. Um, there was an interesting article uh, some of you may have caught that was written at, at, uh, by SDX Central that was published, I think, late last night. Um, and they tried to summarize all the presentations that happened yesterday, um, and specifically from uh, the carriers, from the telcos. And it was interesting, as you read through, what they found was that there were basically three themes that kept coming up over and over again from all of the telco presentations. And the first key one is as they're looking at SDN and NFV, the key thing that none of these end users want is to get locked in to any one vendor. And that's the biggest concern. The second thing that they said is, we would, we would therefore like, an, we'd like to deploy open technology, but our concern is if what happens is that, is that there are 15 different open projects, that's an improvement from 15 closed projects, but we still have a problem. We actually want some standard platform um, that, we can, that we can deploy in our environment. Um, and then the third thing that they shared is they said, now all of that's good, but their advice to the vendors is, we're not into doing endless science projects. It's great to explore the technology and get to understand SDN and NFV, but if you're not solving a specific problem for us, you know at some point we're gonna run out of patience and we're gonna go do something else. So to summarize really what, what the carriers have been saying, what they said here, and I think what they've been saying to me for the last couple of years is that we want three things. We want solutions to our problem, reversing it. We want solutions to our problems that are built on one standard de facto platform that is open. So that's one key piece. The second key piece to look at it is the fact that I think that there is a broadly held understanding that the network that we have needs to change to be able to deliver on the needs of the coming uh, decade or the coming two decades. I think many of you may realize that for the most parts of the networks that we have today, uh, haven't changed that much over the last 20, 30 plus years. They were designed in a model for scale that is dramatically smaller than what we have today. And in a sense, we have evolved, those, we've evolved our networks um, simply by building and patching on top of an old model. Certainly from the carrier perspective, I think what, we've, what we're seeing now especially is demands that far, far outstrip and, and demands of growth that far outstrip the capabilities of the underlying and, the, and both the, the OPEX, but even, sorry, both the CAPEX, but even more importantly, the OPEX is such that it is really straining every major operator in the world to be able to keep up with, uh, to keep up with that. And so I think that you get these two pieces. At a high level, we all know that the network needs to change. At the practical level, we have to actually have specific solutions to problem for people to actually adopt them. And so the, the question comes back, if what we really need is a new platform that is open, that people can uh, build on top of, that solves real problems, how do we get there? Is this possible? Um, and so if we look at it, is it possible? I think the answer is yes. But I think everybody in this room would agree that it's not going to be easy. The recipe in itself is very simple. The challenge is in execution. So if you look at what is the recipe of what we need, the first one is how do you bring the entire industry together and actually get them to agree to actually collaborate with each other rather than sub-optimize for each of their existing technologies as well as immediate market objectives. The second one is it's not just agreeing in principle. It's actually getting the industry to come together and build real code, build an actual platform that they can then build products on top. And then the final one is, if all we do is have vendors building technology, but end users never deploy it or never use it, we've actually wasted all of our time. And so all three of those elements are required. Everyone together, 
actually working to build something with end users involved, uh, involved and deploying. Before I, I go on, I want to acknowledge something that I hear over and over again from people. When I talk about this as the vision for our industry and the vision for open daylight, the natural reaction that I get from many, many smart people is, you know what, that sounds great. That sounds very idealistic. Doesn't sound very practical. It sounds really hard. I'm not sure if we'll be able to get there. And I want to acknowledge that I think there is a lot of truth in that sentiment. Um, at the same time, I do believe that few things that are worth doing are easy. And while this is difficult to achieve and requires strong execution by a wide variety of players, people within foundations like mine, but also member companies, also end users, there is change required at all levels in the industry. While this is in, uh, incredibly difficult, the need is so great that I believe that we will actually get there. And so I want to share someone who I find incredibly inspiring. Uh, some of you may know this man. His name is Ben Horowitz. Um, he was an entrepreneur uh, in Silicon Valley, built a number of companies, uh, sold uh, his companies for a lot of money, and is now one of the top venture capitalists uh, in the world. And Ben Horowitz, if you haven't had a chance, wrote a phenomenal book about leadership, management, and entrepreneurship. Um, it's called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And he has this wonderful line in there where he's talking about an interesting insight. And it seems obvious, but it's worth thinking about over and over again, which is he says, the hard thing about hard things is that they're hard. What does he mean about that? He means, here's the point. Anything in your life, think whether it's in your personal life or your business life, if you have a really tough problem, often we think, oh, someone out there is going to have an easy answer. Someone listening to it will go, well, I know the answer. But the truth is, if you have a really hard problem, there aren't any easy answers. It will take time. It'll take time understanding what your objectives are. It takes time understanding what capabilities you have. You may have to recombine ideas that you had. You may need to get tremendous input. The hard thing about hard things is that they're hard. There are no easy answers. And so I want to start this presentation from here to acknowledge that what we're talking about trying to do is something incredibly hard. The other thing about hard things that I find is that there, it is much, much easier to figure out why they won't succeed than how they will succeed. Because another truth about hard things is they're hard because there are a million reasons why they might not, uh, they might not succeed. Um, and only a few ways, or in fact, we may not even see how we're going to get there. And so again, before we go on to everything else, I want to put out there and acknowledge for everyone that whether we're talking about SDN in general, NFV, or reinventing our entire network infrastructure, this is difficult. Yet, what is amazing about this time right now is unlike two years ago, where I might have told you a great vision, you might have dismissed me and said, hey, that's great, you're an optimistic guy, but uh, I've got better things to do, more practical. I can talk about te technologies and people out there. Two and a half years into open daylight, we've made significant progress. And in fact, more and more people, day in, day out, are suddenly acknowledging and saying, you know what, I'm not sure I believed, but I'm actually seeing it start to happen. And so if we talked about that recipe of the, of the major things, getting an industry together, getting an industry to talk about open, getting vendors to be willing to collaborate, we're seeing it across the board. We've certainly seen it in open daylight, and we're seeing it in other places. Um, we're seeing very large companies. You see a lot of them are the ones that are able to, to really give me significant funding. Yet you're seeing a lot of very small companies also participating. You know, what's even more exciting is take a look at the three newest members in the Open Daylight Project. What do you notice here? It's really interesting. You've got an established vendor that's been around for a long time, trying to figure out how to, how to keep itself relevant and keep innovating. A small startup you may never have heard about that is going after the virtual CPE market uh, in NFE. And an end user. An end user that themselves is trying to figure out what does this mean? Realizing it spends more money on networking 
than half the other, the other companies in America. All three very different companies with very different goals are all coming behind saying, open daylight is strategic and important to us. We want to support this project. The investment in general um, has been growing at tremendous levels. If we look at um, this side over here, we, here what we're looking is, uh, is contributors. So these are developers who have added a line of code, what I call above the line. These are people that I see. They write a line of code that goes into the open source product that can be leveraged by the entire world. 502, uh, as of July, it is today 510 people have actually contributed just to the Open Daylight project. Now, below that, we've estimated over 2,000 people are working with the, open daylight, uh, with the Open Daylight code base, building products, building solutions, end users, research institutions, excuse me, vendor corporations. The number of projects, when you build a project like ours, you build it in a modular way, Think of these as microservices, in a sense, or components. We're seeing, again, an exponential growth um, in the number of projects that are coming up. This is a really great sign. In fact, to put this into a bigger context, it is not just in open daylight, but across the, in, across the entire open ecosystem, we've seen a tremendous number of resources. So what does this mean? 674 people, from June 14th to June 15th, 674 people have had their salaries paid to actually write and donate code that is freely available by the entire industry. That is, a, that is incredible in an industry that has almost no history of doing anything in open source. And if you look at the total number of commits, a commit is when you take a line of code and you commit it into, you offer it into the main line of that code. We're talking 24,181 in that 12-month period by open projects. Um, I'm sorry, some of you may not be able to read uh, the top. We've got Floodlight, Ryu, uh, Open vSwitch, uh, uh, Open Contrail, Onos, and Open Daylight. And I must say, I am quite proud that when, in general, the community, whether it's the people who wrote the checks or the people on the ground writing, when they looked at the different open SDN and open NFV projects that they could contribute to, over half of them chose to do it in the open daylight community. So now let's get, let's double click. What have these people been doing? How do you truly build a platform? If you look at an open source project, there are really two different kinds of open source projects. One, one type of open source project is to build an application, right? Hey, I don't like Microsoft Word. It's too expensive. I wish there was an open version of Office. Let's go copy Office and build one and give it away for free. You've got people who go do that, right? And there are hundreds and thousands of those. The other one, which in many ways is a lot more difficult, is to say, no, that's really not what I'm interested in doing. What I'm interested in doing is building a broad platform that can stimulate a whole range of innovation, solve many different problems. I think the best example of that in the world is, is Linux. Where if we look at Linux, most of us might think of Linux as being a data center operating system, in fact, the leading data center operating system of our time. Yet, what's interesting about that is how wrong that is. Because if you look at the number of installed instances, the number of installed instances that are sitting on servers in data centers is actually dwarfed by the number of installed instances of Linux on a whole range of other use cases, from Android phones to that seat back entertainment system that you may have seen on the back of your airplane, to that little camera that's on the front of your surfboard when you go surfing, to a supercomputer that is measuring, uh, that is measuring the rate at which uh, nuclear explosions may happen in a, uh, in a meltdown in a nuclear power station. What incredible range of things that have been built on the Linux platform. And if you think about it, all of that comes down to someone sitting down and saying, I am going to build a kernel not to solve any one problem, but to be able to serve as the base of solving many problems out there. Why do I tell you this? Because in the network industry, we've had the same question. What should an SDN controller be? What should truly a platform look like? If carriers tell us they want one platform, what are the key elements to it? Some people, I think, correctly bring out one of the things that we really want to do is to be able to manage flows, and that's really important. 
But other folks have said, yes, but I also have a whole set of legacy hardware that I want to be able to interact and manage. Some people say that they want to do a VPN. Others say, no, what I want to do is to be able to do discovery. I want to do security and many other things that we haven't thought of. And so as our community has been wrestling with that question, the answer that they have come to thus far is that to truly be a platform, we need to, on one hand, be able to work with a wide range of underlying hardware, from legacy hardware that was installed 10 years ago that still hasn't been fully depreciated, all the way to brand new projects that are deployed in Greenfield. And at the same time, we have to be able to put a set of applications and network functions based on a wide variety of use cases. So in our community, the first focus was on building an abstraction layer, a service abstraction layer which would allow us to, in many ways, split those two elements. Core to Open Daylight is this idea that not only do we want to support the different hardware and the different protocols that exist today, but we want to make it very easy for someone to show up and write their own. If you've heard me speak before, you've probably heard this example. There's a gentleman uh, sitting in the back who is uh, Don Clark, who is currently uh, with a, an organization called Cable Labs. If you think about the cable industry, they've got a box in my house. And they spend a lot of time thinking about how to talk to that box in my house. They've designed an entire protocol solely to talk to that box in my house. It's called Doxis, right? Now they have a question, when they look at SDN, how do they deploy SDN? Do they need to abandon the Doxis protocol that has been, uh, that has been in, uh, baked into so many of the things that they do and adopt OpenFlow or some other protocol? Well, in the short term, that would be prohibitively expensive. And so if truly they want to be able to manage a cable network end to end, one of the questions is how do you use Doxis with an SDN controller? Turns out that Doxis is not actually that different from OpenFlow and that they were able to come within open daylight and in fact build, if I can find PCMM right there, PCMM COPS, that they were able in two weeks to build, uh, to build a working POC or demo of it. And within about six weeks, they were able to get uh, something working and get it into the project within one release. When you look at a chart like this, the number of boxes at the bottom may look like complexity, but in fact is a huge strength of an architecture. It means that it allows you to go in and serve a wide range of different needs. At the same time, there's a question of what, what use case does an SDN controller serve? And what you find again is if we, if we define SDN as simply separation of control and data or SDN as the use of open flow, well, then you can re really define it pretty well. But if instead you, de you define it as the ability to deliver a new kind of network programmability. Then you start to find that the range of different uh, network services that you may want to put on top of a controller is actually quite wide. And this is exactly the experience that we have seen. I, again, I don't necessarily need you to look at, to read each one of these. If you do, we have a, uh, a printed version of this downstairs in our booth. But what we realized within the open daylight community is it's important to allow people to build their own small modules, packages, microservices, whatever that, whatever that you want. In fact, what we're really doing is not reinventing anything, but leveraging a tried and true model that has worked over and over again in a, in a broad set of open source projects. That if you can allow someone to define a specific problem, build a piece of code um, that is wrapped up in itself, that has clear ins and outs, you are able to actually scale a project in a great way without necessarily harming the ability to do things like performance testing and integration testing. I'm not saying that it's easy, but it is something manageable and it is something that we've seen before uh, in the industry. So certainly the other speakers will talk a lot more about this architecture. I think the things that I want you to remember is if the key goal of Open Daylight is to be able to provide one platform to serve a, a range of current use cases as well as potential use cases, the architecture of the Open Daylight platform built around a service abstraction layer, the ability to uh, model what you're looking for in Yang. I knew that was going to happen in the middle of my presentation. Uh, the ability to model it in Yang and a modular architecture that allows the community to build different functionality and allows you to assemble just the pieces that you need at install 
is core to how we have built Open Daylight. Open Daylight in many ways <coughs> serves many masters. It serves the needs of end users, it serves the needs of uh, the vendor community, and it should. S some of you may know this gentleman, his name is uh, John Donovan, he's really one of the key thought leaders and driving executives at AT&T. And he said something which I think he said very well, something I think a lot of us intuitively understand, which is everything in your business can't be secret sauce. If you think that everything that you do is far better than everyone else, you're deluding yourself. The truth is in most companies, what you end up doing is most things you do relatively similarly to, to other companies in your industry. And you try to differentiate, and you try or, or succeed in differentiating yourself on a small set of things. And so he talks about, he says, you know, secret sauce should be like Tabasco. If you don't know Tabasco, it's a very small container. It has very, very hot sauce that gives you a kick in the mouth when you put it on your food. So secret sauce is like Tabasco. It should come in small containers. He looks at his infrastructure and says, historically, we haven't leveraged much open source. It's been about 5%. But we recognize that, I, that we need to be able to focus our resources on the things that really make us different. Well, how do we stop spending so much time on the other stuff that doesn't make us different? We should be leveraging a lot more open source. And he quantified that. He said, and everybody at at and at this point in infrastructure knows this, we want to move to over 50% of our underlying code being based on open source. Now let me be clear about what he's not saying. He's not saying I want to stop paying for software. Nor is he saying I hate vendors. He's certainly saying I hate being locked in to one specific vendor. That doesn't work for me. Uh, at and is very, very, very willing to pay people to solve problems for them, to install it, to do testing, to deliver what they need. However, he wants it built on an open platform. What's interesting is while a year ago I could have done the first part of this presentation, now I get to the part that I couldn't have done a year or two years ago. Because what we've seen over the last year or two is that people have taken young emerging technology and actually placed it into their production networks. And it's amazing. If I was building a startup, it's very difficult to take a room of engineers and turn it into something that's in production. Certainly not when we're talking about a carrier's infrastructure. Yet that's exactly what we've actually been seeing. This is, a, uh, this is from a presentation that was given at the Open Daylight Summit by two gentlemen, uh, one from Marantis, uh, one from Telstra. Uh, they were looking at their network, and one of the first things that you notice is that if you're an Australian company, one of the, if you want to make money, you've got to serve a multinational use case. They have a whole set of points of presence all around, all around the world. And they were looking for how do, we allow, how do we make it easier to provision these complex networks across all these different pops in the world. Well, they looked around. They found open daylight. They saw that it could be used to solve. Mirantis did a little bit of work. And they're able to get it into their environment in production uh, very, very quickly. Really, what they built was they leveraged that core service abstraction layer, the model-driven uh, service abstraction layer. That's what MDSAL stands for there. Uh, they're leveraging the OpenFlow protocol. Uh, in their environment, and they've been very happy uh, with the impact. This is really what we're seeing in a lot of places. People, as the carriers were saying, look at a problem, solve a problem, and then expand from there. Now, you know, 20 pops is great, but how much traffic is going in over Telstra? Tough to say, I don't know. They haven't shared that with me. But I do get a lot of questions about scale, and so I thought I would illustrate that with a different example. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you're familiar with a company called Tencent. Show of hands, how many people have heard of Tencent? Well, about half the run. Okay, so Tencent is a, it, it's a uh, Chinese company. It primarily serves the Chinese market. They really have two major apps that they do. One of them is a uh, chat app called WeChat. Um, it has about 600 million users on it, pretty impressive. They also have a, uh, a set of uh, mobile, mobile games as well as some uh, voice uh, chat capability. Because of course they're serving the Chinese market, the scale that they have on their, on their environment is just beyond almost every other company in the world. Now, interestingly enough, on, uh, unlike say a Facebook or an Amazon or a Google, we see something interesting with some of these Chinese ones. When Google began designing their infrastructure, there was no open daylight. Um, frankly, uh, OpenFlow was it in, 
was in its infancy. And so people like Google had to invent SDN for themselves in their own implementation. They didn't have the luxury to be able to, uh, to leverage an open source project. But Tencent has come a little bit later uh, than Google. And so they had a choice that Google did not have. They could build it in-house themselves, or they could leverage an existing open source project. And of course, they did exactly what you would do. They leveraged an existing project. And so they came to Open Daylight. They looked at Open Daylight versus other options and very quickly determined that Open Daylight could solve a wide range of their problems. They looked, looked for the lowest hanging fruit. It was the interconnect between uh, their data centers. And they immediately began architecting for themselves. Um, interestingly, the first case, they used uh, an outside company, Marantis, to build it. In this case, the Tencent team primarily did it uh, themselves internally. They had a little bit of help uh, from Huawei, Huawei and from Cisco, but for the most part, it was their own internal architecture team uh, that built it. What's interesting is how quickly it becomes attractive to have one platform. Because after deployment, they looked back, they talked to each other, and they began to communicate to their vendors and said, you know what, by the end of this year, we are asking all of our vendors, if they want to sell to us, they have to be open daylight uh, uh, compliant. They have to be open daylight compatible. So OK. Open daylight helps small telcos, large website companies. Is that the limit of our impact? Actually, I would say I think that the impact of a project like ours goes way beyond. And as I said, there's a set of things that we, problems that we see today, but there's a much bigger set of problems that can exist in the world. And uh, this next case is, uh, this next case I think is one that I find very interesting, which is, we're, you know, we're all thinking about how networks stand in the way of making profit. Um, but how does it necessarily make the world a better place? Next, I'm going to tell you about a group in Canada. As you know, uh, many countries like Germany, uh, in Canada, they're very conscious about uh, the environment. And so one of the things that they have been looking at is how do they lower their carbon footprint? How do they lower their energy usage without actually lowering their GDP, without a cost? Is that possible? And so you're seeing all around the world, and I think Quebec is a great example, of people saying, you know what, if we can actually build a cloud, gather a whole set of data, say, on weather, on usage, we can actually get a lot smarter about how we use electricity, how we use, uh, how we use water, how we use uh, heating, and our use of natural resources. To be able to do that, they needed to build a cloud. The cloud needed to be able to scale. So of course, they turned to OpenStack, but also realized that they need the ability to instantiate networks very, very quickly. And so once again, they looked at Open Daylight. Um, in this case, they worked with a couple of our members, Ericsson and InnoCybe, to be able to do that. And they built, uh, they built a solution with OpenStack and Open Daylight together to be able to have this, what they called a green cloud. I should say they're not unique there. In fact, I am seeing more and more people all around the world looking specifically to have this kind of dynamic infrastructure. They want the ability to spin up compute resources. But they're realizing that one of the things that stands in the way is actually the ability to instantiate networks that way. And this is, as we'll talk about in a little bit, this is one of the dominant use cases. Since we're here at this show, I thought that I would, uh, I would put up an example that you're going to hear tomorrow. Um, I'm not going to go into the architecture of this slide, but I, I wanted to highlight, there's a gentleman named Alex Zhang. He's, a, uh, he's an architect for this company here in the uh, top right-hand corner, uh, China Mobile. Just like Tencent, China Mobile obviously is focused in China, and they're seeing a an incredible rate of adoption uh, in terms of number of users as well as the amount of data in their environment. There also is tremendous opportunity for them in terms of what services they offer to their, uh, to their, to their end users. So whether it's consumer or SMB. One of the key parts to their ability to deliver new services is the ability to build a cloud that can scale based on their needs. Once again, just like so many out there, as they look at the requirements to be able to build that, OpenStack is clear on the compute side, but it is lacking on the networking side. It does not come with a controller. They want an open source controller. And so they're building their cloud environment on open daylight. I want to pause here to point out uh, that one of the questions that often comes up in anybody who's using open source is what do you use from open source and what do you get from proprietary? I personally think that 
it is actually a good thing that you have people that will sell solutions around open source, and there are many models that work. You can have someone simply providing support around a pure open source solution, or you can buy a proprietary product that is mostly proprietary and has some open source embedded. And there's some models in between uh, that are also valuable, where maybe a piece of the solution is open source and a piece is proprietary. The challenge we have gotten in the open stack, in the open stack world is that networking isn't an add-on. Networking isn't an app. It is a core part of the infrastructure. But until Open Daylight, there really hasn't been a standard uh, controller networking infrastructure that is open for OpenStack. And so people have had to go look at companies like Nuage and Contrail and VMware NSX. It's actually been a, a big concern that you're locking in a key part of the underlying infrastructure of the solution. And this is why there's been such a strong push for Open Daylight to actually build out and invest in delivering solutions for OpenStack. And I'm very glad to see that after a lot of work, we're really getting there. We've had a lot of investment in this area and we're starting to see people deploying uh, Open Daylight with OpenStack uh, in environments, uh, in environments uh, that are going, uh, getting close to production or that are actually in production, like I just said. You know, talking about making the world a better place, I love this other, this other uh, example. One of the funny things about running an open source project is there's some things very similar to running a public corporation. There's some things that are very, very different. One of the things that's very different is in a corporation, you know your customers. No one implements your, your software without you knowing about it. In an open source project, that happens all the time. So this is a great case. First I heard about this, there was actually an article that I read in, in the news. Turns out that CERN and Caltech found that they had an interesting problem. Some of you may know, uh, not far from here in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, there is the world's largest particle accelerator. They slam particles into each other and get a tremendous amount of data. In fact, every month they generate 200 terabytes of data. And there are researchers sitting in Switzerland analyzing that data, but in fact, there are hundreds of researchers all over the world, thousands in fact, who want to be, who want to get access to that data. The problem is, there's a lot of it. We're talking extremely big data. And so what do you do? So initially, they found a way to send it to 13 tier one sites. That's great. But they found there were actually 460 others. They call them tier two and, uh, and tier three sites. Could they actually get that much data out to 473 total sites in the world? Well, that, that requires you to think differently about how you're going to manage your network. And in fact, yet again, they look at OpenFlow as a great way to be able to solve their problem as they look for a controller, they turn to Open Daylight. One of the interesting things here is you might think that I tell you they chose Open Daylight because Open Daylight was by far the best solution to solve their problem. It might have been. But when we talk to them, their actual number one reason for picking Open Daylight is they said, what we see in the industry is that Open Daylight has become the de facto standard open controller out there. As a community of scientists that is collaborating all over the world, they love the fact that Open Daylight is open, but more importantly, they love the vibrancy of the community that exists in Open Daylight because it mirrors the experience of what they have within their own physics community. So with the last part of my presentation, I want to double click one more time and talk about the four major use cases that I am seeing for SDN out there. Now, I could probably give you a whole presentation on this, so excuse, I'm going to keep it at a relatively high level. But for the most part, almost every deployment that I hear about, almost every problem can, can be fit within this framework. The first set of challenges that I see people have is, I have an existing network, or I'm building a new network. But I have a challenge in being able to, number one, understand what's out there, map what I have out there, and be able to start making changes out there. Some of you may say, that doesn't sound like SDN. That sounds more like management and orchestration. At some level, I don't really care what you want to call it. It is a need out there. There is a need. And why I put it in here is I think it is highly related to the other three. Because it is very difficult for you to start truly programming your network if you don't know what's there. It is truly diffi difficult to start walking the path towards programming your network unless you have an ability to start pushing changes. This is how you learn how you want to manage your network. And so this is a very real use case and we're seeing a whole set of people 
wanting to do that, and open daylight can be used to do that. Now, of course, there is what most of us would start understanding as true SDN, right? The ability to do this proactive network management and traffic engineering. And certainly a lot of people are doing that. And so if I look at open daylight, I see plenty of people uh, who really want to do netconf, and that's what the, the key focus are. But a whole set of people for whom OpenFlow is a key focus, or other protocols to do something similar. So within the traditional network, I think things boil out within those. There's certainly some hybrids in there. Um, the other two are quite different. Um, we're here at the show uh, talking a lot about network functions virtualization. I think the first thing hopefully everybody is clear about is the purpose of network functions virtualization isn't to virtualize the network functions. Everybody know what I mean here? Uh, the reason you want to virtualize the network functions is because of, because of what that allows you to do. Really the purpose is to be able to have better orchestration, better automation, and to start being able to put intelligence onto my network. But the first step of that is if I've got physical boxes, there's very, there's, I have very few degrees of freedom to what I can do with a physical box. It is only when I can make that into a virtual entity that now I have the ability to spin it up, to move it around, to map it differently, to add analysis to it. And I think this is something that is lost a lot. That people think, oh, NFE, all right, great. It's about delivering VMs. People want VMs more than boxes. Yes, but no. It is what you can do. And if we forget that piece, we're lost. Yet it will take us a few years. It is a necessary step. You need a wheel before you're able to have a, before you're able to have a horse buggy or a car. Um, one of the interesting things on the NFE side is in some cases scale is very important. In other cases, scale is not necessarily the defining characteristic in terms of the number of VMs in the environment. This is a key difference from the fourth use case, um, very much more centered on the data center side, which is really around uh, cloud. And as we saw with Quebec, as we're seeing with uh, China Mobile, certainly as we build out cloud infrastructures, private clouds or public clouds, the there's a need to have an agility on the network, this time potentially a tremendous scale. And yes, you can do that without a controller. But you really don't want to. You can map directly to the hardware. But in a sense, it is, it is as if you go in and you're, you're building a whole new wing to your house, yet you don't touch the rotting back end that you already have. Who's using Open Daylight? We recently did a, uh, a survey in the, uh, at the end of the summer. We uh, got responses from 128 companies. And you know what you find? It ranges across the board. Absolutely, we're seeing uh, telcos and service providers leading the pack. Um, the reason is actually quite simple. It has nothing to do with the underlying technology. It doesn't necessarily have to do with, with the needs. It has to do with the fact that there is no company on the planet for whom the network matters more than a telco or a service provider. Right, if you, look at, if you look at a telco, the percentage of their costs that goes to buying equipment for their network or managing the network, it's far, far higher than you would see from a retailer or a bank or a manufacturing plant. Therefore, it is not surprising that they're the ones who are willing and able to invest most ahead of the curve of others. So then you ask, well, who else cares a lot about the network? Well, it's really interesting. You see companies like Thomson Reuters who, in fact, you might not think as a telco, but they're using the network tremendously as part of what they're doing. Certainly seeing research, academia, uh, the web scale companies like Tencent, the network matters a lot to them. Who else? Who's next? Well, then the financial services, and then finally the tail end of people for whom it's important, but one of many things, are your more traditional enterprise. Not surprisingly, engagement with open daylight and deployment of SDN and FE maps almost perfectly linearly to either your percentage of your costs are in the network or how much your profits are dependent on your network evolving. You also see this married, as I said, in terms of the involvement with the Open Daylight community. About nine months ago, I launched a program in Open Daylight to, to allow end users to really have their voices heard, to really engage deeply with the development community. One of the big differences between open source and enterprise is that in open source, you have the ability to have end users talking directly and having visibility directly into the development of the underlying technology that they want. If you're buying, if you're, if you're buying from a corporation, closed software, you go through a product marketing, a salesperson, a product marketing manager, a product manager, a dev manager, and maybe if you're lucky every once in a while, you, 
uh, you get to talk to an engineer. Usually, you're affecting them through uh, product requirements, documents, and maybe uh, product plans. In a community like Open Daylight, in a community like OpenStack, you have the rare ability to gain visibility, in fact, have input directly into the process of creating the technology which you want to use. And it's been fabulous to see so many of the world's most interesting institutions, you know, from, as we talked about, companies like Tencent, stock market like NASDAQ, telephone uh, companies, uh, old telephone companies, new telephone companies, Europeans, Americans, Asian, uh, Caltech, Arizona State. And most recently, as I was saying, we started to see us shifting from that first adopter to that next level with people like Thomson Reuters and, and Credit Suisse. These are not suits wanting to get something else on their resume. These are real network architects taking time off and out of their jobs uh, because of personal interest to work with the technology, look at it, share their insights with each other, and then directly into the development community. And this is an invaluable resource for us. For example, recently we had a set of questions, a big debate within the community that came up around what does it mean for a project to be called mature? What, how do we put requirements as we evolve projects, sub-projects, with, uh, within, our, uh, within our project? And you know what? There are lots of opinions within the developers. But I pushed them to reach out to the end users. And what we found is that the end users came in and said, here is what these words and these terms mean for us. Here is how we're going to deploy. And they're able to provide invaluable feedback, which is going to change the way the development community thinks about how they run their own projects. This group is uh, growing significantly, and I'm really grateful to the amount of time that we're seeing these individuals put in uh, to supporting our project. Open Daylight is about people connecting with each other via collaboration. Open is not a flash in the pan. Open Daylight isn't a flash in the pan. This tr it truly is a wave sweeping our industry. People are seeing that open source isn't a cancer. Open source isn't that other thing. It is something serious. And, and often, it is now being considered a key part of company strategies. 20 years ago, it became clear that in many industries, if you didn't send someone to the IETF or to NANOG or, or to any of these standards organizations, you'd risk not having end users buy your products. However, what it meant is that, unfortunately, standards became a battlefield. It became the place where you score points against your enemy. And we were in this constant battle. And unfortunately, they became less and less useful and less and less relevant. What I am seeing is that, in general, the era of standards wars is over. It doesn't mean standards don't matter. Standards will continue to matter. And we're going to still need to keep sending people there. But that's no longer the, uh, the major defining dynamic in our industry. Instead of fighting over standards, what we're seeing is people understanding the value of collaboration. I love this example because cycling is different from almost any sport in the world. In most sports, you spend the majority of your time competing with your competitor. Cycling is unique. Yes, you collaborate with your team. But in fact, if you are Nairo Quintana here, you may spend more time in a race actually collaborating with your top competitor, Alberto Contador, than you will collaborating with your own teammates. Because in cycling, unlike other sports, you spend the majority of your time fighting against the wind. And there's a 30% effort difference between going at it alone and fighting the wind alone rather than sitting on the wheel of somebody else. He's shielding you from the wind. And so they continually keep helping each other right until the final few kilometers, at which point it makes sense to say, OK, gloves off, let's go. And then they truly compete with each other. This, I think, is the right model for where we're moving in the industry. Yes, you still have competitors. And yes, of course you want to win. But you realize it makes much more sense to collaborate around the non-differentiating pieces and only seek to compete in these areas in which you're unique. The other thing we're realizing is, despite the fact that where I live in Silicon Valley, people love to talk about disruption and Uber putting a lot of people out of business and Airbnb and all of that that actually most change in the world happens not through destruction, but through evolution and renovation. 
And especially if we look at our network, it is very possible that the current model is horrible and we're going to throw it all out and start with something new. But I don't believe that's likely to happen. Instead, we realize we have to change the wheels of the car while the car is driving. We must think renovation rather than destruction. And this is why what you're seeing is throughout the industry, not just in networking, we're seeing open collaboration becoming the dominant way. Yes, open daylight is increasingly being seen as something that is likely to succeed. People even start calling it inevitable. It's a little strong. Um, certainly is music to my ears. But we're seeing this with things like cloud nating computing around containers and the open container project. Uh, certainly on the hardware side, not an LF project, but you're probably familiar with the open compute project. If you know anything about platform as a service, the Cloud Foundry Foundation is part of the Linux Foundation. The All Scene Alliance um, is an alliance specifically around the Internet of Things in a protocol over there. The, excuse me, the OPNFV project I assume you know all about within uh, NFV, Core Infrastructure Initiative, is making sure that the core technologies at the heart of the Internet aren't being left alone, managed by two guys named Fred, who are making less than $20,000 in donation and living in the basement of a house somewhere in the world. And so what we're seeing in over and over again, people are understanding collaboration is not only possible, it is the best way to drive the industry forward. And since I built this presentation, we've actually seen two more little projects come in to, uh, come in to the Linux Foundation, something called IOVisor around being a, able to program down into the chip um, and the Onos project. Some of you may have seen uh, this announcement around uh, the Onos project joining uh, the Linux Foundation. Um, those of you who haven't read the announcement, the announcement yesterday was that uh, Onos, which is the open network operating system, um, has joined, has gone from being a separate project under a uh, Stanford lab called OnLab and joined the Linux Foundation. And this was released yesterday. Um, I refer you, I wrote a long blog about my full perspectives. It'll give you a better sense that I can give you right here. But I do want to give you the gist of what I wrote in that blog. Because a lot of people ask this question, Onos and Open Daylight seem to be somewhat overlapping, somewhat uh, competitive. What does this mean for ODL? What does this mean for Onos? And on that, the point that I want to make is running a successful open source project requires you to do two things at once. And in fact, it is a balancing act. If you're copying Microsoft Word, it's actually relatively easy, right? You take the spec, you see what it is, you build those features, and you're done. If instead you're building a platform, especially a new platform, you can't just simply copy something that already exists. You have to learn as you're doing. In a company, you try one thing, hit a brick wall, turn around, try something else, hit a brick wall, turn around, try something else. In an open source project, you can parallelize that. So on one hand, what you're balancing on the left side of that is the ability to, to, to explore many different things, to innovate through exploration. And that's great. That allows you to get to market much, much faster, innovation to market much faster. On the other hand, however, if what you end up with a, is a whole bunch of open technologies that all roughly replicate the same thing, you actually don't, you haven't achieved that much for the end user. This is one of the things that uh, I think Axel Klauberg from uh, Deutsche Telekom talked about uh, in his keynote. The other key role of an open source project, beyond enabling this radical innovation, is to provide standardization around a good enough code base that people can build a variety of things around. Linux may or may not have been, in many times of its life, the absolute best way of building an OS kernel. That's not what mattered. What matters is enough people said it's good enough to go build all of the things that they built on it. And so you're constantly balancing exploration versus rationalization. Why do I say this? Because this is why it is so good that Onos is joining the Linux Foundation. Onos is yet another group of smart engineers. 79 people have written a line of code for Onos thus far, who have been exploring a subset of the full set of problems that we have in our industry, specific to carriers, specific to one technology. And they've made some really interesting discoveries there. And that makes us all richer. At the same time, it is clear from an end user standpoint, in the same way as I have three different competing ways of, or I've had three different ways of doing network virtualization, a couple different ways of doing a service abstraction layer, uh, different models and ideas of how to scale controller elements. 
we need to get towards some level of standardization and rationalization. And so having Onos within the same family as Open Daylight allows us to begin to collaborate a lot more, to open the kimonos, to have discussions among our engineers, to learn from each other, to grow from each other, and yes, long term, to potentially to rationalize technical elements. It's not necessarily going to be an easy journey, but it's the right one. So the last thought that I want to leave you with is my rule of collaboration. I'm not going to claim that it's uh, truly unique, but it's something that I care about a lot. I often get the question, how do you manage all these different interests? To some, uh, to some extent, the answer is I don't. But I do facilitate it. And what I find myself saying over and over again, I think this is true in an open source product, this is probably true within your company and also true with your friends and your family, is the first step is understanding that collaboration is not about getting others, others to do things your way. It is that our natural knee-jerk reaction to want people to do things our way, yet collaboration is about understanding and beginning with this <laughs> idea that we is greater than me. And that therefore I know that I'm going to walk in, I'm going to compromise some areas, I'm going to be open to finding a third way in some areas. And when everybody comes with that, we may have heated discussions, we may disagree about a lot of things, but together we can get a great answer. I see that happening a lot in the Open Daylight Project. It's happened a, a lot in the past. It'll keep happening. And I think this is what's going to happen between Onos and Open Daylight, between the 500 people in Open Daylight and uh, the new 79, which will grow to whatever it is. Um, and this is why I think this is such a positive thing. And so what I want to leave you with is welcoming you to, uh, to this uh, Euro Summit. We've got a great set of talks for the rest of today uh, and tomorrow afternoon. You'll, you'll dive in much more deeply. I think the other thing I hope you'll experience is a little bit of that community. Approach people, get to know them. Um, don't come in and tell people what you want them to do. Express to them what, you're, what problems you're looking to solve. If you're willing to take on even a little piece of solving that problem, I think you'll find many others willing to shoulder the rest of the burden there. And with that, thank you very much.